My name is Izzy Greenberg. I run the Middlesex Coalition for Children. I am one of the co-chairs uh, of the Connecticut Early Childhood Alliance. These calls are being sponsored by the Early Childhood Alliance, by the Middlesex Coalition for Children, by the Connecticut Association for Human Services, and by CSEA SEIU. Uh, we do have interpretation available this morning. I'll go through those instructions first. Uh, Ava, can you give the instruction in Spanish? She's still not hearing me. Okay, um, so click interpretation. Select the language you prefer. I'm choosing English. Then click interpretation again, which now says English for mute me and hit mute original audio. So I'll go through that one more time. Uh, you click the, and, and if you couldn't hear me, it's because I was waiting to choose my language settings. Um, but you can uh, choose interpretation at the bottom, then uh, pick the language you prefer. I'm choosing English. I click it again, and I click mute original audio. If you don't do that, you will hear English and Spanish feeds simultaneously, and it can be very complicated. Um, for the time being, I am not going to, um, have hands raised. Um, we're just gonna get through the first part of the meeting and then we can call on folks towards the end. Um, Ava, are you available to give that instruction in Spanish? But I need you to be on the main feed. Thank you. Hola, buenos días. Si escuchas mi voz, estás ahora mismo en el idioma de inglés. Estás, escogiste el idioma de inglés. Si necesitas traducción en español, por favor, marca en tu pantalla interpretación, interpretation in Spanish, Spanish, español, marca en tu pantalla interpretación en español en tu área de herramienta y después traslada para Spanish. Asegúrate poner en mudo el audio alrededor, mute surrounding audio. Si tienes problemas técnicos en cualquier momento, nos puedes enviar un mensaje a través del chat, el C-H-A-T, es una cajita en tu pantalla, y en cualquier momento, si tienes una preguntita directamente a los panelistas, por favor, utilice la cajita de Q-I-A, la cajita de Q-I-A. Izzy, back to you. Okay. Thank you, Ava. Uh, thank you to Wildelies for providing tra uh, translation this morning for us. Um, and we will be using the Q&A function. Um, our guest this morning is Nathaniel Raymond from uh, Yale University's um, Jackson Institute. Um, we will uh, be talking about public health and reopening childcare. I know there is so much to manage and to consider and to think about in this time. Uh, for now, we are going to begin with um, me asking some questions that were kind of prepared in advance based on the questions that you all have been asking over the last few weeks. Um, and then in the second part of this, we will, um, well, you can put in questions into the Q&A anytime you'd like. I just won't get to them until the second part of the meeting. Please keep the questions in the Q&A relevant to today's discussion. If you have questions about uh, care for kids payments, other things that are relevant to you but not relevant to this conversation. If you could hold off on those, um, we may have time at the end for them. But uh, we have Nathaniel here with us till about 10.15, and so I want to maximize our time. I'm also not going to allow uh, hands raised at this point, but feel free to use the chat to, um, to talk with each other, to share information with each other, and to um, let us know if you have any technical difficulties that you're facing. I am going to launch the um, poll this morning just to find out who's here and, um, and what, what type of provider uh, you are. So you are all welcome to fill that out as we proceed. Um, okay, so um, Nathaniel, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I'm gonna put the spotlight on you. Um, and I'll just ask questions if that's all right, because otherwise it goes back and forth between the translation um, and, and we lose us all. So um, if you could just maybe start with giving us a one minute synopsis of the work you've been doing during the pandemic, just to kind of ground our attendees in, um, in your area of expertise. So I led a uh, task force of 65 uh, students and faculty to support the mayor of New Haven. Um, and help design New Haven's COVID response. Um, additionally, I've been serving on uh, task forces with the United Nations, with the World Health Organization, and the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And 
what I've mostly been looking at, uh, to be <laughs> to be honest, is air conditioning and uh, the role of HVAC uh, in transmission of the pandemic. Um, really, what we've done here in New Haven has been informed by um, my work as a disaster response planner and humanitarian aid worker uh, overseas where I've done about five or six epidemic or pandemic responses before COVID, including cholera, Ebola, um, uh, Jeepers, Hanta, Dengue. Um, so mostly waterborne and mucosal, but um, I've done, this is my second respiratory pandemic. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, end the poll because we've got about 75% here and share the results with you all. Um, we have um, primarily licensed providers here, some nonprofit staff. Um, let's see. And then um, about 40% center directors, 10% center staff, and 35% family child care owners. So if that um, just helps you to have some grounding and who is on the call with us today, we've got about 200 people here right now. That number usually fluctuates as we um, move through the meeting. So um, I'm going to close that for now and keep going. Um, so thanks, Nathaniel, um, for that. And uh, I guess the first thing that I would love for you to go through is if, if, if our providers and our um, community are trying to think about um, crafting policy to keep everyone safe, about doing the right things within our um, institutions and centers and homes. Um, what would you say are the, the kind of guiding principles that people should use in their decision making? So when there isn't, let's say, clear guidance on um, a particular cleaning supply or whatever, how do we go back to, you know what, follow these guiding principles and you're going to make better decisions? What would you say those guiding principles would be? So before I answer your question, I'm going to say I'm going to answer your question twice. Okay. And we're going to divide this question in half. The first part is what actually works um, to prevent transmission and things that you can use as guiding principles about people not getting sick. Great. The, the second part is going to be what I call optics. Uh, <laughs> that this is, this is a... Uh, a very difficult pandemic in the sense that what people see as having effect and what actually has effect in terms of transmission are very different. So I'm going to talk to you about what your guiding principles are on preventing infection. Great. The second part is guiding principles on showing others what they are looking for <laughs> in terms of preventing infection. Does that make sense? The two are not the same. So Great. we're going to divide them in half. Great. The first part is so focused on just from a public health and virology perspective on what you can do and what you should have as your guiding principle so people don't get sick. The number one thing to bear in mind here is that you need to treat this as an airborne pathogen. It's the air. It's not surfaces. So uh, there's been a lot of focus on hand washing in the early phase and a lot of focus on disinfecting. I get that. It really doesn't relate to how people get sick from COVID um, because that's, um, I'm going to use a fancy term here. We initially thought this was a fomite vector, meaning it was transmitted by surfaces. We now know through unfortunate, tragic experience in the evidence that it is primarily transmitted through small particles that if you looked at them under a microscope, they would look like a torpedo when they come out of your nostril. And that these particles can gather together in indoor spaces and basically aggregate, gather into a large number and hang in the air on humidity, moisture, on smoke, on pollution, and hang in the air for um, minutes after they have come out of the nose or the mouth. And so the, the number one way 
to prevent transmission when you can't be outdoors is to open a window. Positive airflow in your indoor environments is your number one weapon against this disease. Um, related to that, masking, we have um, extremely good scientific data that simple cloth masks prevent transmission. They also prevent someone from taking it out of their body. It also prevents someone from bringing it into their body. Now, this is the most important point on masks. Masks can actually reduce the severity of COVID if you get it. And we've only started to know this in studies that came out in the past week, that the best part of masks is that they reduce the viral load that an infected person transmits out into the world. So the, the big moment for those of us in response planning was what we called the Missouri super spreader. Did any of you hear about the Missouri super spreader? It was, <laughs> and that's what we call her. She was a woman in a hairdresser in Missouri who was fully symptomatic and um, she was infectious. And she, however, demanded that her patrons wear masks. And though she was infected and came into contact with 140 patrons, none of them were infected because both ends of the transmission chain were masked. And so for us, we found that even with highly infectious people in close, close contact and in indoor spaces, the evidence is showing that even one end of the transmission chain being masked can reduce the severity of the infection, even if transmission happens. And this is a very important point. So point principle one, open the windows, um, have positive airflow. If you have an air conditioning unit um, and you have to be using an air conditioning unit, make sure it's connected to fresh outdoor air and that's coming in to your facility. So second part, masks on you, masks on all parents you come in contact with. Okay, third principle. Um, we have a lot of new data and very good data on the transmission risk of children, both transmission to children and transmission from children. Um, let me summarize what we know we know <laughs> in terms of the transmissibility risk of children. Um, we are now seeing around nine to 10 year olds, definitely 13 year olds, but nine to 10 year olds start to transmit like adults. And the evidence is showing that. In the United States, and listen to that very specifically, the data on children is different in different countries. Okay, so in the United States, what we're seeing is that children under nine transmit about 50% less than adults do. Now, we don't know why. <laughs> we don't know if that number will change, but right now we're seeing a transmission rate in American children that's reduced to about 50%. What is interesting about that is in Scandinavia, uh, my colleagues in Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, and Denmark, we are seeing almost 0% transmission rates in Scandinavian children. We don't know why. In American children, that is not the same. What we're really concerned about here is that there seems to be a genetic relationship between susceptibility to the disease and susceptibility um, to be a transmitter that um, also applies to children and it applies to gender. And so here's one thing we do know is we do know that males, whether they're children or adults, are more likely to become infected. And we do know that 
um, Latinx and African American populations are more likely to become infected and are more likely to die. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, we think that some of those reasons are genetic. It is not settled science, but we are seeing some very clear indicators that the risk of transmission, the risk of fatality, and also the way in which the pathogen acts in the body has a genetic and demographic link. Um, so, and that applies in children too. It definitely does apply in terms of looking at our fatality rates amongst children or higher in communities of color. Why is that? I can't tell you. We don't know the one sentence and it's complex. But what we are seeing is that American children transmit less than American adults to summarize. And American um, children and American adults appear to have a demographic and genetic link in susceptibility. So that means that your plan as a key principle has to be sensitive to the fact that those demographic and genetic factors are real. It means you have to take extra precautions with these highly vulnerable communities. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now, on the optic side, people want to see disinfectant wipes. They want to see <laughs> hand washing stations. And I'm not telling you to not hand wash. You should always wash your hands. Um, but you will have to do communication to parents that your precautions on air and on masks are more important. Additionally, um, another principle that's both optically good and good from a public health perspective is called cohorting. You want to, if you have multiple staff in multiple ages of kids, you want to limit contact between staff and between large groups of kids, and that's called cohort, and it's in the CDC guidance. And so what, what you want to do is break your staff and your kids into smaller groups and then rotate them. If you have multiple rooms in a facility, rotate them throughout the day and try to keep them out of contact with one another. There's three reasons for that. One, it will reduce transmission between kids, between staff. Second is it will make contact tracing easier if there is an infection. Third, it allows you to do what we call a staggering protocol, to be able to stagger small groups through um, bigger spaces so you have time to clean and to make sure there's positive air exchange as they move through. Um, that's a critical thing. Parents are going to be looking for that, but you also should be doing that from a public health perspective. And the, the last critical principle here that's both good public health and good optics, um, you need to know where, who's in the households of your kids. So um, in many cases, you will have multi-generational households. Um, you will have elders in those households. If there is an one bit of evidence that you have a potential outbreak near your facility, <laughs> within your facility, you need to, to know what your vulnerable households are. At the end of the day, all of them are vulnerable. But you have to have a sense if you have um, uh, elders, if you have um, uh, at-risk comorbid, immunocompromised family members. That's important information for you to be aware of. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm just taking some notes here so that I can post that in the chat for everyone. Um, so I, I've got wear masks, open windows, make mm -hmm. sure back or air conditioners are set to intake fresh air. Uh, children over nine are uh, transmitters, potentially like adults. Under yeah. 
maybe a little less so, um, that there could be a genetic um, and certainly demographic link. So uh, be extra cautious with vulnerable populations, yes. specifically Latinx and African-American populations. Keep people in small cohort groups, uh, stagger them, clean in between, makes the contact tracing easier and keeps people safe and know who your vulnerable households are. Yes. Not at all. Okay. I'm going to post that into the chat for everyone so that you all can have access to that. Can you also just um, a little bit more information on um, children under nine is primarily what we're talking about, though not totally with this population, with a group here today. We've now we're now up to about 250 people here. Welcome everyone. Um, uh, can those children um, uh, receive the disease from the adults in the spaces? Um, so if children over nine um, spread like adults, do they also um, contract like adults? Um, it, do younger children have less likelihood of contracting it or having it in their body as carriers? We don't know the full scientific answer to that question. We do know that children can appear to have contracted it from adults. Um, and we have seen evidence of what we call unique symptomology in children that I'm sure some of you are familiar with, which is Kawasaki syndrome. Have you talked about this? A little bit, yeah. Little but you bit. could go through I don't know that everyone's familiar. So in a population in, I believe it was Queens, it, during the New York part of the outbreak, we saw a presentation of what's known as chillblains um, in a colloquial uh, term, but uh, the, the medical term is Kawasaki's. And it's basically skin lesions um, that are seen on the toes and the extremities. Um, we believe this is COVID related and this is a unique symptomology uh, in children. Uh, now, I'm not gonna speculate about uh, why this is happening, but simply to say that what we're trying to figure out right now is really focused on um, genetic risk and unique genetic risks for the immunological development and immuno health of children that may be causing this. Um, what really matters for you is three things. Children can die from this. Anyone who is saying that children somehow are not fatality susceptible, in other words, that they will not die from this, that is not true. They can die from this. We have a cluster right now in Texas of about 10 to 12 infants uh, one has definitely succumbed. I think it, um, it may be up to two fatalities um, within a neonatal care unit at a hospital. So infants can get this, toddlers can get this, and they can get it from adults, and it can look like what happens to adults. Second part, it can do unique things to children that it is not doing to adults. Third part is that um, you should not take lightly that um, even if a kid has it and it is mild, we are now learning it can cause long-term effects to the child in terms of pulmonary, cardiac, and neurological health over months. So lung health, heart health, brain health, can be affected even if they don't have it severely. Okay, great. And um, what about siblings? So, if we're thinking about cohort groups, mm -hmm. um, how do you uh, how do you think about siblings? Should they be in the same sub in the same cohort, even if that's not sort of age appropriate, or or, or do you keep them age appropriate? I mean, I don't know. How, how do you think about that? That's a really good question. I don't have. I'm just thinking about this for my first time now. Um, I, what I can tell you as a rule of thumb is that you always wanna be, here's our catchphrase, building the bubble, right? And as you build the bubble, how do we build the bubble? We build the bubble by knowing as much as we can about the activity patterns of the people in the bubble. So 
in your question on siblings, what's really good about siblings is that if you know the activity pattern in the household exposure risks of one, you likely know the household exposure risks of the other. It's more efficient and it helps you build the bubble with better information. Okay. Um, just, I don't know the answer, but I do know that your rule of thumb is build the bubble and you build the bubble by knowing everything you need to know about who's in that bubble. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Um, one of our, one of our uh, um, attendees is sharing that, um, that she was infected by a nine month old child. So um, some, some information here even. Um, and everyone, I am taking notes and we will share a Google doc with you at the end um, that has all of this information in it. You're welcome to take notes, but we're doing that as well for you. And I'll share the link to that in the chat um, after we're finished. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just keep moving through this. Is that all right with you, Nathaniel? All right, um, so I guess uh, people here are coming from rural communities, they're coming from urban communities. Our state obviously has um, a lot of uh, variety in terms of what, what our neighborhoods and, and towns might look like. And because we have um, health departments in 169 of them and we have the state telling information, it's not always easy to know what uh, trends are and what you should do on a sort of town by town basis. So I guess what I'm wondering is, are there, <clears throat> maybe this is a, another sort of different kind of guiding principle question, but um, what should people be looking out for if they're seeing that there's, let's say, a spike in a part of their town? Does that mean that they need to um, institute extra precautions? Um, are there indicators um, that are in the city that are different from maybe rural parts of the state? Um, and I guess, what are the indicators people should be looking for um, kind of out in the world or even in their parent population that would help uh, providers the best decisions about keeping people safe? Sort of coming, this is more like an outside in question. This is great. And this is what I think about every day. So I'm designing the early warning system for New Haven that's also going to inform early warning on these questions for Yale. And I'm, I also teach at the US Navy War College in the Humanitarian Assistance Disaster Response Program. And we're trying to figure out this warning system about COVID for the Navy. Um, so I think about this all the time and I think about it in terms of Connecticut. And I look at the county level data and I look at the town level data very closely on not only a daily basis, but about three to four times a, a day. Right now, here's the good news, everybody. Right, being in Connecticut right now, you are probably in the best place in the United States to be in terms of COVID response. Um, we are in great shape. The numbers uh, put us in and out of what's called a green zone. And we, last week, we were the only state in the U.S. that had green status for part of the week. Um, so this is the good news. The bad news is everyone's running out of reagent for testing. And what you want to watch is the turnaround time for tests in your town. When it gets over eight days, that's very concerning. When testing is under eight days, in Connecticut, you should feel very competent. <laughs> Ideally, you want to see testing results immediate to 72 hours. That's when that information helps public health people like me and my colleagues do contact tracing. Um, if any of you heard about what happened last week in New Haven, we had an outbreak at the uh, church, Spanish speaking church on Grand Avenue. It was about 10 folks. Um, most of them were kids, maybe all of them were kids. I don't know the exact demographic breakdown. Because we have good testing resources, we could identify and contact trace. And we felt very comfortable that within 72 hours after that lockdown on Grand Avenue, that we did not have community spread. Meaning that within that church community, there was additional cases. So what, what I'm saying is, in your communities, if you see that principle one, if testing is taking a long time and cases are going up, 
that means we're in a bad place. Because if the positivity rate of those tests coming back are high and we are getting slower and less tests, then, that, then we're in trouble. We are, we're blind. <laughs> Second thing to watch is where the outbreaks are occurring, particularly as it relates to work environments. Um, for example, there was a, a, a spike at the Greenwich Whole Foods amongst cashiers. That is something to watch. When you hear about people in your community who work at one facility, and that facility has become infected, meat packing plant, dairy, logistics facility, it's not so much the number of cases, it's where they are occurring with density of people in an indoor setting at transmission that concerns public health people. Um, having a lot of little cases in a household setting, that's worrying. What's super worrying is the IKEA, <laughs> the, um, the Amazon Fulfillment Center has become infected. That means that it's significantly bigger and it will move into community transmission very quickly. So one, we're watching for testing turnaround. Two, we're watching for what we call super clusters, right? In specific environments. Three, we're watching for specific communities having certain types of outbreaks. So, colleges as they go back to school. Um, uh, that's concerning. So if you see um, young people have an outbreak, that's a warning sign. You see senior care facilities have an outbreak, actually less of a warning sign because we can contain that and we do that well. But when you see demographic, ethnic communities, African-American community, Latinx community, when we see that demographic spread, that for us is the most worrying factor. Okay, um, and so how do folks learn where the outbreaks are happening in their community? How do they learn that it's the Whole Foods or the meat packing plant? A lot of that information is not available and frankly, it should be, okay? <laughs> so it, in the case of New Haven, the, when we have those outbreaks, such as the Grand Avenue church outbreak, the mayor comes and addresses that directly. But that's not the same for every community. But here in New Haven, we're very focused on making sure that the public knows where there has been an outbreak within New Haven. Um, in many cases, um, Connecticut will um, make some of this data available as it relates to, say, uh, senior care facilities, but does not have to make it available as it relates to specific employers. Um, so the law is different. The best place to look for information should be the CDC. It isn't. <laughs> um, right now, frankly, the New York Times and the Washington Post, particularly the New York Times, provides the best and easiest um, county level data about Connecticut. So, and they have a color coded little bar, which I find very helpful. If it is red, orangish red, <laughs> it is going up in your county. If it is turning yellow on that bar to gray, it is going down. And for me, that's like the, the odometer, the speedometer on the car here is watching that on a county level tells me where to worry. Um, in Connecticut, we're down, we're negative <laughs> in every single county, which we should feel great about. Here's the bad news. It can change within 72 hours to 21 days and go the other way. And so our critical time, if we can make it through about September 6th to October 10th, if, if Connecticut can hold it together during that time, then we should breathe a big sigh of relief. If we are going to have a second wave in Connecticut, it's gonna happen then, 
and it's going to be likely part of what we call flu A, flu B nexus, meaning okay. that it'll, it'll interact with flu transmission. Um, so given the, uh, the temperatures that we're facing right now, I think I can see that there's a ton of questions coming in around air conditioning. Um, so let me just say a few of them and then maybe you can go into a little bit more yeah. detail about it. Um, so one thing is about using germicidal UV light to kill the virus. Um, and what about HEPA filters? Um, how, can, um, how can people find out if the air conditioning unit that they're using um, you know, if they're, let's say they're in a city building, can they request to the city to have it looked at or for a landlord to confirm that? Um, so kind of what can you do to, uh, to make the air conditioning units that you might have more safe? Um, and I think that, yes, yeah, so HEPA air filtration, does that help? Um, I guess that's separate from air conditioning, potentially. It, they're directly related. Okay, and so just start there. Here's the main thing. One thing you can do, no matter what type of system you have, talk to your landlord, talk to your super, whoever it is, and make sure they have cleaned their filter and replaced their filter. That's an easy request. And, you, and you'll be able to tell the parents, hey, we have a working filter, we have a fresh filter, we have a replaced filter, here's how often it gets changed. The second thing is, have your super, your landlord, whoever it is, walk through with you the actual pieces of your air conditioning system. And it will be different in different buildings, of different ages. Um, you need to know where the return valve is. It is the thing that connects to outdoor air. And, What's pardon? Called? Return valve or return vent. And you want to make sure that, if possible, that air condition unit, while still cooling your area, um, if it can be set to a setting where more fresh air is coming in, where you have positive air exchange every 15 to 20 minutes, that would be great. Um, what we're finding, we don't have a set number, but we find that it takes about an hour of continuous exposure to get COVID. It's not a, a quick passing transmission. And so when you are replenishing air more often, the chance that you will have enough viral particle gathered together becomes less. Okay. So, so um, on the UV, and specific type of filter questions. We are at the early days of trying to figure out the quality criteria to evaluate specific filters and to evaluate light systems. I do not have a responsible answer for you on whether one filter or one light system is better than another or whether the UV lights actually effectively kill it. Um, one thing about the, so this is a SARS virus. It's a severe respiratory virus. The previous SARS virus before this, this is SARS-2. SARS-1 um, caused an entire apartment building in Hong Kong to get infected. It's known as the Amoy Towers incident. And we know from Amoy Towers that it was the air conditioner. Um, now, now there's a difference between SARS-1 and SARS-2. And the difference is this is significantly stickier. So it has an outside layer of fat on it that makes it very sticky. This is a long-winded way of saying that we are trying to do the science right now to figure out how that stickiness works with different filters and different types of ultraviolet light systems. We don't have that answer yet. Any, and if you hear anyone who says they do, um, they likely should not be listened to. Okay. Um, so basically no answer on UV or HEPA. But, and, and for small, small window units, is it just clean your filters? Clean your filters and have, and when it's cool, open the window. 
All right. Izzy, can I just ask a follow-up question quickly? You can. Um, you had just mentioned that it takes an hour. Is that one of the reasons you're suggesting children move around into different rooms? Yes. Okay, so that's very understandable now. So if, if they move, go ahead. Yeah, let, so there's six dynamics that we believe relate to transmission, six factors. The first is velocity of air. When it's moving fast, it becomes hard to get infected because the clouds of virus can't really aggregate or can collect. When it's moving too slow, sometimes the, the clouds can't move as much, if that makes sense. When the, when the speed of the air is dangerous, it becomes like the lazy river at a water park where the virus is like the inner tubes on the lazy river at the water park, and they just keep moving around in a circle. Let me stand. The fans help with that? Well, yeah, let me, and with the second dynamic, we'll get to it, which is what we call zones. So we had an incident at the Orlando International Airport. 500 people were tested. 280 were infected. The contact tracing made no sense. Um, they were not in contact with each other. Um, well, what we started to see is that they were in common air conditioning zones. So getting to the issue of fans and vents, um, when you create a zone, um, and that could be a room with a, um, an AC in the window, that's a zone, right? A whole Costco is a zone. <laughs> um, you want to break up your time in zones. You don't want to marinate, right? You want to move in, you want to move out, and you want to change the air. That's the number one thing you can do to beat this thing, combined mm -hmm. with masks. So velocity, we like velocity. Fast air is safe air. Second part, we like moving out of zones. <laughs> Third, density. We want to reduce the amount of people in a zone as much as possible. The more people that are in a zone, the more risk of transmission. The fourth element is humidity. This thing loves humidity. <laughs> so the more particles there are in the air, the more it sticks to stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the fifth element is time. The more time you are in a zone with high density, with consistent airflow, and someone is infected, the higher the chance you will get. It. And then the last element is viral load. And so the, the more sym symptomatic, <laughs> the more infected and symptomatic people there are in the zone, the larger the viral load is, right? So you want to um, really, that's why the mask is important, because even if you have a lot of viral load in an environment, the mask can reduce the severity of infection. We don't know what the number is, but we think it's somewhere between 500 to 1,000 particles of this virus are required for infection. That's a lot. That's a lot. And so that's why time is so important. You need a lot of time with a lot of viral load to get that infection. And it usually comes through the mouth or the nose. It can come through the eyes, but mostly it's nasal contact with over 500 to 1,000 particles over an hour. Okay. Um, so I want to go back for one second because I'm getting some questions about this. When you describe um, a potential uh, genetic or demographic predisposition, the, 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 I guess the question I have to that is, uh, we've talked a lot about the um, the factors, sort of the institutional and structural racism produces the kinds of factors that make certain people more susceptible to things. That wouldn't be called genetic. That would be... Um, We'd call it social determinants of health. Exactly. So those are social determinants. So are you finding social determinants of health that are causing um, predisposition or truly is there is there a genetic component potentially? Oh. So we looked at autopsies. There was a Lancet study on autopsies in New Orleans. 
of African American males who had passed away from COVID. And it was the viscera, so I'm gonna use some technical terms here. The viscera was unlike anything we had seen in Caucasian patients. Um, their lungs were liquefied. Uh, the alveoli, the sacs in the lungs um, had fallen apart and the bronchial trees had collapsed. We have not seen a, a, a set of uh, forensic factors like that um, in white patients. And what that makes us, th um, what we are exploring now is that the red blood cell element here has, goes hemorrhagic in African American and potentially Latinx cohorts in a way it does not in Caucasians. What that means in English is that the blood cells um, break apart and they may be attacked by the immune system directly or they may rupture related to a genetic marker that the virus is latching onto um, that is more common in African-American and Latinx populations. Do we have an answer on the science? We do not. Do we have enough initial data here to see that we are, we're seeing a potential genetic factor? Yes, and we have three pieces of evidence. One is this thing tends to attack X chromosomes. And that means that women seem to be less susceptible to it. Why? They have two X chromosomes. Mm -hmm. So if there's a defect in one chromosome, the other chromosome seems to provide some protection against the genetic marker. Um, this is the initial science. And it, this is only 72 hours old. Why we begin to think that men are more susceptible. And we think it's an X chromosome defect. That's one part. Second part, we are seeing type A, some evidence, some studies are showing type A blood type is more susceptible. And there are certain demographic populations that have more type A blood types. Okay. And those correlate to communities of color. What does that mean? We don't know yet. Third part is we are seeing different types of actual causes of death in African-American and Latinx populations. And that's what causes us to be very concerned beyond social determinants of health, racial okay. disparities in healthcare access and social economic factors that predispose. We're also seeing stuff happening in the body we don't understand. And important is because it helps us to protect those populations more. Is that the idea? To be more protective? Is that, I think that's what you had said earlier. Yes, is that um, the way I put it here in New Haven to the mayor is we need to engage in positive discrimination and positive bias. In the early days, we, we, we said we need to move our resources to New Hallville, Dixwell, Whaley, to our highly vulnerable communities, and we need to put them first because we know they are more likely to contract. We know they're more likely to die and we know that they are more likely to experience long-term effects. We knew that early on. And so we saw that here in New Haven as a duty of care to prioritize those communities. And right now, um, you need in your practices on a local level to prioritize those communities as well, because even if the kids are not infected, they are in households that are at high chance of having the worst consequences if an adult is affected beyond the social economic, but related to the social economic. Okay, thank you. Um, so social determinants of health, yes, potentially some genetic link because of um, red blood cells and type of blood and uh, chromosomes, obviously with gender. So understanding that there could be some, some things that are happening in specific bodies and some things that are happening in social determinants in community, that combination says, let's absolutely make sure that we are protecting certain populations. Yes, and, and we, we know enough to know both are happening. They, they activate together 
nitro meets glycerin, and it's a time bomb. Okay. Um, all right. What do you think about face shields? Um, I'm not a fan of face shields, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, one is that they only really work if you're dealing with droplets at close range. If someone spits in your face, now you are dealing with creatures that do spit in your face, <laughs> which would be infants. In the case of on a changing table, um, there it may make sense. But where it really matters is if you expect liquid to go flying at your face at close range. If, if you were worried about the air specifically, it's a cloth mask. Only use an N95 or a replaceable mask if you can replace it regularly. If you do not have that type of PPE, use a cloth mask and wash it routinely. Face shields only use if you expect to get stuff flying at your face. And in most cases, glasses will protect you. Okay, thank you. Um, so people are, are wondering, since you've been through um, other pandemics before, in terms of just your kind of opinion on how this thing is happening and moving, do you have any sense of like, how long are we going to be doing this? Like, is this, are vaccines, are the vaccines that are coming out now looking positive enough that we can see some light at the end of the tunnel? Or are we just kind of like in the trenches and we're going to stay here for a while? Um, if we had a functioning federal response from day one, we would be in what I would call an Italian posture right now. We would have had the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, the Northeast wave. And then we'd be in a position where we would have testing, mask discipline, and good public health communication combined with social distancing would put us in a position now where we could lock down any small spike within 72 hours. Um, we are not there and we are not there because of a failure of federal leadership. If we have effective federal leadership come January, by about March, April, we will be where we should have been in April, May of this year, which is in what I call the Italian or the European paradigm. Um, we would be like Germany is now. Um, if a vaccine was made it through the final trials today. It would take us um, about, if we were moving at miracle speed, six to eight months at least. And here's the three things you gotta think about in terms of vaccines. Um, we need to know, not only does it not kill people, we need to know if it's generalizable. And what that means, that word is very specific. We have, for some diseases, we have to use multiple vaccines. We have to use four to five. Um, this is, looks like it's going to require multiple vaccines to be generalized across a diverse population, especially since we're seeing this potential genetic aspect. What a vaccine that may work for me may not work for Izzy, may not work for Ava. Um, and so we need to figure out that generalizability. We haven't yet. And until we do, we don't have a vaccine solution. Second part is vaccines are only as good as you can distribute. Right now, there's a global effort to build the vials, the actual glass vials needed. Third part on a vaccine is really, um, here, here's the bad news, is that herd immunity is not gonna happen with this pathogen. The antibodies that it generates are very, very low. And so the, the issue of the vaccine is we need to be able to evaluate after the vaccine is created, how well it support, how it performs versus the human antibodies that are naturally generated. Right now, the numbers are not good. Um, so while we're seeing some initial vaccine success, it is highly likely that the vaccine candidates we have right now could fall apart and not perform better than the human antibody. So conservatively, we're 18 months away.
Okay, so we, we have a lot of vulnerable populations on this call. And so people I'm seeing a lot of concern around um, this sort of genetic thing that you suggested. Um, does that mean, so, so the Caribbean seems to be doing pretty well right now with a low death rate, but does that make, you know, the Caribbean or the African continent, even South America, more vulnerable to the virus? Or is this kind of like an Ameri like the way that it's working in America is different? That is a very good question. Um, so I know on the genetic issue it is very scary, and I've said very scary things. Um, the thing I want you to bear in mind is that right now, if you use masking and social distancing, regardless of what population you are in, you will counteract, you will limit, mitigate the degree to which those genetic factors matter. We know that these social distancing and masking works across populations and contexts. Um, I'm doing research now in refugee camps where we are finding in some of the most difficult conditions on the planet that masking and six feet have the same protective effect. Okay, the most deadly thing with this virus has been social determinants of health. It is um, people, and we know this from 200 superclusters, regardless of what population you're from or where you are on the planet, if you are indoors, in close proximity for a long period of time. That is the, no, the number one um, factor for transmission. And so right now we need more science on the genetics. In the meantime, it is about getting out of density, being in a tight group and protecting indoor environments through fresh air. Okay, all right. Um, I'm just going to remind every. Well, we're we're wrapping up now. Um, I have. I'm gonna. I'm reminding everyone that all of the notes and the recording of this will be posted on my website, which I'm gonna share with you in the chat in one minute. Um, and the recording takes a little while to upload, so it will probably not be available until later tonight or tomorrow. Uh, but um, we will also share it on the ECE listserv once it's available. Um, I, I think we've got a million more questions we won't get to, um, but I think the kind of one that seems like people are really interested in is um, how do you feel about reopening public schools? Um, if we had a regional travel ban for Connecticut, I would feel very good about it. Um, we do not have a regional travel ban. Um, if we had New England as a bubble, I would feel very safe. And if we had a guaranteed um, amount of testing supplies and a, a pipeline of testing supplies for New England, I'd feel very good about it. Um, the, if we were just looking at Connecticut or just looking at New Haven right now, I'd feel great about it. Um, but we're looking at the United States of America. And right now, the United States of America has an uncontrolled outbreak through the South and Southwest that um, potentially in some places may exceed or has exceeded what we've seen in New York. The numbers out of Florida right now in Texas and Arizona are what I watch to understand what's going to happen in Connecticut. So I look at numbers elsewhere to try to figure out what that's going to do to um, supply shortages on testing supply shortages on PPE and supply shortages on our doctors and frontline responders because they are on planes going south now to support Laredo and Houston and Tallahassee. Um, so if, if we get those places under control, I will feel better and better about schools being open in Connecticut. Until they are under control, we should assume a lockdown posture. Um, that's not going to happen. We are going to reopen to some degree, um, but it's really going to be contingent on how the outbreaks elsewhere in the United States affect our ability to test, monitor, and contact trace here. Okay. Um, 
I promised I would let you go by, well, 1030. I'm two minutes late. I'm so sorry. But uh, we are so, so grateful for your time today. Um, I think this has been both terrifying and enlightening and uh, much more information that, than we've been able to, to get otherwise. So we are so, so grateful for you to be Can here. Can I say one thing to your members? Absolutely, please. Yeah. Um, you guys are on the front line. You are having to make impossibly hard decisions and you are having to evaluate risk, which it is not your job and expertise to do. I have immense empathy for that. And I'm sorry that you're in this position. Um, and you're in this position because of a failure of leadership on the national level. Um, and I'm almost crying because it makes me so angry. You should not be having to make these calls. You should be getting clear messages and clear guidance from your national leaders. And you should be able to trust that and take that to the bank. And so um, I'm here to support you and support um, your colleagues, Izzy and others. Um, uh, it is essential that you have the support you need because you have the most precious commodity in your care. <laughs> um, and we should all be treating you like the heroes you are. Thank you. Thank you again for being with us. And um, I'm gonna let you move on to your next thing. We are uh, extremely grateful. There's a lot of comments coming through in the chat, uh, comments of gratitude coming through for you. So um, we will be sharing the recording um, and you know, about 260 people were here today, but this will be shared much more widely in our community. So, so we're very, very grateful for the help today. All right, bye con Dios. Bye, thank you. Okay, um, all right, so. I guess we have a lot of questions, unfortunately, that went unanswered. I think though we did get a lot of information that will be very helpful to us. I will share the, um, I will share, uh, if you look on, on the website down under, um, I think it's past events. Um, if you look there, past meetings and webinars, I will post both the recording and a, uh, the notes that I've taken today, which outline all of those kind of essential things that he said. Um, if we can, through the next half hour, answer any questions um, in the Q&A, we will. Um, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everyone's questions. There's still 24 open questions, um, but, um, but I'm glad that we were able to have that, that exposure today, so, um, okay. We are going to move on now. Um, Meryl, uh, we've got maybe some federal advocacy stuff. Um, if there's anything that you or have that you want to update people on, um, do you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, we expect that um, Mitch McConnell will come out with a Republican Senate um, COVID response plan today. Um, of course, we expected it last Thursday and he couldn't manage to get his caucus in line. Um, so, you know, the $600 a week pandemic unemployment insurance has just run out. Um, so as has the federal uh, eviction uh, protection. So things are starting to get real and um, we will now see how much pressure that puts on Congress to act. Um, there are some speculating that uh, it will probably take the stock market taking a nosedive before um, there's real progress here. But um, the Republicans are talking about a $1 trillion package. The Democrats passed uh, a bill through the House three, two and a half months ago called the HEROES Act, which is a $3 trillion proposal. So um, there's a, a long ways between them. We have heard rumors that there will be something in the Republican proposal for um, childcare. It's not as much as we want. So it is very important that if you have not called your members of Congress um, and both your, your, your representative in Congress and your two senators, um, that when we get off the call today, you should do that. Um, make it very clear that the childcare industry is in trouble and we need $50 billion put into this COVID relief package. We, um, yeah, go ahead. Can you also um, highlight that uh, Representative Himes is on the short list of people uh, nationally that need to be um, spoken to, um, as is Johanna Hayes, I believe, as well. 
Um, Johanna Hayes has been a huge supporter, but what we need to do is thank her and ask her to make sure it's not traded away and that we get as much money as possible in the bill. And the same with Heinz, that we don't want this traded for something else, that this is a whole industry that's going to go down. So with all of them, we now have our entire delegation has um, co-sponsored the Child Cares Essential Act which is the bill that Rosa DeLauro put in for an emergency appropriation of $50 billion. That's the good news. The bad news is that that bill is a message bill. It's not anything that we expect the uh, Senate to take up. The House is probably going to vote on it this week as a way to sort of reinforce that this is something that they care about. Um, but the only way that anything is gonna actually become law is if it gets put into the COVID relief package, because that's the only thing they're going to get done um, in the Senate, except for maybe confirming some more judges. Um, they are only in session for this week and next week, and then they all take off to go run for re-election. So it is really critical right now that um, all of our members of Congress get the message that this is really important. This needs to be in the final package. And uh, you know, don't let it get traded away. Um, if you have friends or relatives in other parts of the country, um, please reach out to them and ask them to call their members of Congress about this. Um, we need to get some support among some of those other, uh, other legislators outside of Connecticut. And you could do that through your Facebook pages as well and any other social media that you use, reach out to everyone you know in other states because it's really, really critical. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so you all couldn't hear me typing in the chat and everywhere else. Um, all right, so let's see. I just wanna see if there's anything else. We wanted to do one more poll also. Um, Ava, can you introduce that? Yep, we actually just got in the chat someone who asked about DCF. So very quickly, the, the anonymous question was, did we hear from DCF? What happened to DCF? Um, I will invite Georgia, if you're on, let me see if she is. Sorry that we always put you on the spot here. Um, but Georgia, you, you are uh, allowed to talk if you want to unmute yourself and just stop me at any point. So during our last call, when DCF was not on and basically canceled on us. We went ahead and contacted legislators on the spot. Um, Liz Frazier had a wonderful idea to go directly to uh, the chair of appropriations for the House of Representatives here in the state of Connecticut, uh, Tony, um, Tony Walker. And I must confess that she responded immediately uh, within 20 minutes, but because I was translating and caught up on this call, I was not able to patch her in. She sends her, um, her greetings. She is more than happy to come um, on live to any of our calls, and she is going to make this a priority for her. Um, on that moment, like in that moment when she was trying to get on the call, she also called uh, Commissioner Durantes, the D DCF commissioner, and had a conversation with her of like, what's going on? Why aren't providers getting paid? Uh, the commissioner and other representatives of DCF said there was a miscommunication. This is where I asked Meryl, Liz, and Georgia to chime in about that follow-up response that DCF had. Um, they seem to be interested in coming back to another meeting. Um, while we wait for those days and while we figure out uh, what's gonna happen with their response, what I do wanna have right now is a poll because we are not gonna sit here for another month to six months and try to figure out when they're going to respond to us. No, uh, my ask to all of you as advocacy chair is, we get moving, we make a stronger demand than we ever have in the last year. I know it's been a year plus struggle of trying to um, make sure that they listen to us. And we have to put a plan in place of what those demands look like. We have to make sure that we get, uh, you know, the Tony Walkers of the world involved because we just don't have time to waste. With COVID happening, we do not have the luxury providers who accept DCF children, the luxury to wait seven months or nine months to get paid. 
So this has to get fixed now. And that means that we have to give them um, as much push in that direction as possible. Uh, Georgia, Liz, Meryl, would do you want to chime in here? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, as um, Ava shared, we um, circle on our end, um, along with um, this group here, will be working to push um, through the governor's office to have a conversation with DCF and. Uh, um, just again, communicate the urgency of the need for them to really think about their system and to think about how they are going to integrate their system into the either the Office of Early Child Education Connecticut CARES program. And I know that there's some issues with that program for folks, but just speaking from a, a, a technology um, perspective, the fact that the, the OEC was able to build this system within two to three months, it's an extraordinary feat. And so to the extent that um, we see this as a possible, a quick fix um, in the interim to get payment out in a, in a more efficient way to providers as possible, we see that, that as an interim step, if this is where they're looking to go. Um, additionally, um, ultimately what we want is for the DCF payment to be tied into the Care for Kids system. The Care for Kids system is, um, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to use. It, it is accessible to every single provider. It's accessible to folks on our phone. Um, when we call and we, we need information, we can always have um, access to that information in a ready fashion. It, it's, it's not always great, but it's a much better, effic more efficient system than what DCF has right now. And I just think from a statewide lens um, and, and from the perspective of data, I think that's where it needs to rest. So right now, um, they're having their internal conversations. Um, once that internal conversation complete or is completed, um, that's being facilitated by the governor's office, then we are supposed, they're going to circle back with us to kind of bring us all together and figure out a way forward. Um, I think we have to have dual track in how we, we basically deal with this. And from the perspective that every single provider um, needs to really communicate the urgency of the need because one of the things that we also found out is that DCF is saying that, well, we're caught up, we've paid everybody. And I know they haven't paid me and I know they haven't paid me because I haven't billed them because I still don't know how to build them. And so there is real dis disconnection between DCF's perception about what is what they're doing and disconnection with what we're doing here. And so I, we're, we're looking to figure out what those pain points are. And so what I need for people to do before our next meeting with them, um, and that's hopefully we can do something this week, but if you could email me, you don't, please don't put personal information in the emails about children. Um, but just email me some of your stories um, and information about billing so that I can bring that to the meeting and say, hey, here's a huge disconnect between your perception that you are 100% paid up with providers and the reality that you are not. Um, so my, my ask is for people to email me and my email is Georgia. G, um, Izzy, if you could put that email in the, in the chat, that would be really very um, helpful. And just email me. I may not be able to respond to every single person, but if I have all of that information that I can bring back to DCF and say, here is the reality of people and of providers, and here's the reality of how um, providers aren't being paid, and here are the particular regions that are having issues, then um, we can start to hold them accountable to what they're actually reporting to the governor's office. 
I don't know if Meryl wants to um, chime in or Liz wants to chime in. Uh, real quick, Georgia, tell me which, which email you'd prefer me to use. Just it's, say it. It's Georgia at hopechilddevelopment.org. Thank you. At this point, again, it's really about communicating to DCF the breakdown in the system because if they have a perception that they are completely caught up with all of the payment and we know for a fact that it's not, we need to be able to say, okay, so you, you have to let go of the system that you have because here are where you, it's, the system is communicating one thing to you that is completely different from the reality. I think, um, I think, Georgia, this is a very good caveat uh, to our poll. Um, so I, anyone who does not take DCF, I ask that you just do nothing on your screen. Um, this is mostly for those of you who had taken DCF before or are still planning, planning to take DCF children. Um, and you should see it pop up. Let me just open it right here. You want me to launch it? I think it should be launched. Yeah? Okay. So apologies for those of you who are on the phone and cannot see the questions. I'm just going to read them quickly so you have um, some awareness of, of the questions that we're trying to gauge people's um, interaction here. So first question that we ask, do you bill the Department of Children and Families, DCF, for care? What is the longest amount of time after billing you waited for pay? Did you call DCF to notify them of the pay delay? And if so, what happened? DCF has delayed payment to many early educators. What would you be willing to do to help? Specifically in that question, so question number four, for those of you who are politicians, advocates, <clears throat> nonprofit um, leaders and you're not a center director or center staff or a licensed provider, I, I ask that you fill that part in. The DCF has delayed payment for so many years. What would you be willing to do to help? Because this question, I, I want to remind everyone on this call, the, the reason that we're a coalition, the reason that we have this alliance is to take all this early education and advocacy and, and build something that, that is positive, not only for providers and early educators, but for parents. And that means that when we're advocating for legislation, when we're trying to change um, how the government reacts, basically, we need parent involvement. We need, we need these uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, we need the help of providers because when we come together that's how we actually get positive change and when we're having delays this extreme in, and you have a, a foster parent you know for example who's a DCF foster parent and they're the ones suffering when you say I can no longer take your child because DCF delays too long then we should get them involved and if you have a parent that's not a foster parent but understands maybe they used to do it or maybe they have a neighbor or a cousin then they should get involved because the more people who understand that this is a problem and speak up, the better chance we have to actually fix it. And Eva, I just want to add to that. Again, we, I'm finding out more and more about where the pain points are. So I know from a provider where my issues are with DCF, but when I talk to family child care providers, um, the idea of DCF requiring you to um, forego income by putting children in, in, in paid slots without paying them, that was something I was not aware of. So we really need to know, if we're going to really fix the system, we really need to know all of those stories. And I, and I also have to acknowledge that... Um, up until last year, I didn't also know that I was billing DCF incorrectly. And when I've seen a couple of invoices, um, providers are billing DCF incorrectly. And so DCF can say, oh, the issue is because you are billing us incorrectly. And they would not be wrong. 
The problem is DCF also did not um, educate us on how to properly build them. And I think that they do it in a very scattershot way. If one provider calls up and they, they go through that process with one, that one provider, and, um, and I know that they have a, another group um, that they do um, that communication with, that training with, um, that follow-up with, but we are not a part of that group. And so from DCF perspective, they feel that they have done what they need to do to communicate to their vendors how they should build. And this is also one of the things that I'm pointing out in their system that childcare providers are not a part of that um, credential provider group that they're doing all of these communications through. So this really has to be a place um, this organization, this group has to be a place that DCF comes to, um, to really have that communication. And we really need every single person here to communicate that in whatever their capacity is to, to, to bring them to this forum and to this table to have those conversations. Because the other forum is just really not appropriate for us. Um, they have all sorts of providers and vendors in that, um, in, in that forum, and we really have a space where we can have DCS speak specifically to our vendors. And so to the extent that you answer um, on the poll what you're willing to do, I really urge people to do what you can because we're not gonna see any changes unless um, every single person here that's on the call or not on the call, but within your sphere of influence, take some sort of action, even if it's just to come and to show up here and to communicate those pain points to DCF. Because you, you know, you, you, you don't, you can't fix what you don't know. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you for those strong words. And I, I know that we all feel um, very strongly um, as a, as the Alliance um, that we have to get this done. So we're going to take these questions, by the way, these questions were anonymous. So at no point are we going to say, you know, Jane Doe feels X, Y, and Z. If there's any, at, at any moment, if you feel strongly and you want to put your name on your comments, then that's what advocacy is for. And we're here to guide you on how to write a letter, how to make that phone call, um, even talk to news outlets. But this information and this, this poll, uh, we are going to give the results to to, to the representatives and we're also going to share them with DCF to start a conversation like George just said please email her and contact her with personal stories if you want your personal story to be made anonymous you can put that in the email you know say hey this is who I am but please don't share my name if you feel comfortable sharing your name that's good as well and what we're going to do with that information and those stories it'll just give us a little bit more context to to hand over to the representatives who are trying to help us and let them know how including this poll how extreme and severe the delay is and the hardship that you're going through uh, Ava what is your email I'll type it in um, we were you, you want to do mines because I know um, Georgia was collecting the stories she is collecting and also um, representative Comey is asking for your email so actually maybe oh yeah her? So, so my, I, I have no problem sharing my email. I'll add it in the chat here for those of you who are on the phone. It is my, it's my first initial, my last name, uh, E Bermudez, E, and then B E R M U D E Z at C S E A 760.com. Um, and just in case, whenever you register for any of our Zoom meetings, uh, you the email that's attached to those meetings is mine so whenever you're responding to a meeting invite or have a question it automatically goes to me so that's another way that you can have access to me all right great thank you um all right so anything uh others want to say before we sign off for today yes i just have one uh last thing um one of the real cruel ironies of this pandemic is that while we find ourselves facing a health crisis, lots and lots of people get their health insurance through their employer. And so the health crisis is creating um, economic troubles, which is resulting in layoffs, 
which is resulting in people losing their health insurance during a health crisis. Right. Um, the Early Childhood Alliance is working with the Connective Health Foundation to collect stories about um, the implications of this and, and the, you know, what happens as a result of having this system so that we can try and move towards a, a stronger safety net where people have um, access to health care um, more readily than the current system. I'm going to post um, my email here. If you know somebody who's lost their health coverage, um, during this pandemic, um, please, uh, who's willing to share their stories, so not, you know, that I got sick and, but I lost my health insurance. And as a result of that, I, you know, wasn't able to access care or I delayed um, going, getting care. Um, we're really trying to gather those stories about what's, you know, what's happened as a result of people losing coverage. Thank you, Meryl. Um, Ava or Liz, any final things? Um, I guess, uh, I, I think that we all just have to also remember that um, many of us are starting to worry about not being able to stay in business. There's still a lot of effort going on nationally. It's really, really easy to get tired of the whole process, especially when it goes on this long, but we really have to stay focused on what we need to do. So. Uh, we'll try to send send some information out about how to help with this effort to get um, early childhood funding across the country and certainly in Connecticut. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, important to remember we have to <clears throat> we have to keep keep in it, even though it's horrible. And even though most of the information that we got today. Um, doesn't make us feel like we're going to get out of this anytime soon. I feel like we did get some concrete uh, steps hopefully that you all can take um, to keep yourself as safe as possible, to keep your families as safe as possible. Um, <clears throat> I've already posted the notes on my website. Um, and so those are available as soon as the recording is available, we will post that as well. We don't right now have a solid plan for Wednesday. So just stay tuned. Um, we, we, we had told you, I think that Mondays were our big day today. We had a, um, a good speaker. Um, and then Wednesday is kind of the optional advocacy uh, conversation day, depending on what's happening. So a little bit of it is in flux, depending on, on what's happening in terms of the advocacy world. So I guess stay tuned, keep Wednesday bookmarked, um, save the date, but um, we will let you know as soon as we can via the ECE listserv what the actual uh, topic will be. Is a reminder. Yep. Is, this is George. A quick second. You can. Okay, so um, we received from the city of New Haven a request for a proposal for the community development block grant. Those grants are available throughout um, certain cities. I would strongly encourage people to please connect with a family child care network or a network and please find out about the opportunities to apply for assistance through those community development block grants. Um, we did see as a part of the, um, the grant proposal that you can uh, apply for support for businesses. So I would just definitely reach out um, to, your, to your city and to find out about those grants um, available in your city um, through the com community development block grant. I think we have to think a little bit broader than just the OEC about where to find funding. Um, and just a reminder again that those Connecticut Kickstart for Business and those Connecticut supply subsidies are available and out now for people to apply and to have quick access to those funds. I do wanna do a, another um, two reminders here. Last week we had a conversation about how to apply for the PPP loan slash uh, grant. So grant that turns into a loan if, if you don't have um, the proper information uh, filed. But those due dates are coming up. So please make sure that if you need to be, um, if you need advice or uh, if you need a walkthrough of how to do it, uh, Izzy, if you can put your Middlesex um, link on there. So that way anyone online could, uh, anyone that's seeing the chat could click on the link You'll, you'll be able to see the video. 
they did a wonderful job walking through how to do the application, additional uh, comments and questions now that the PPP program has been running for about, about two months, I believe, some, some time now. So they got a lot of the kinks out of the way. The other reminder I have for those of you on the call uh, who were interested in joining the union or associate membership, we did a, a benefit uh, class uh, slash training the other day ago, and that recording is also available. Um, I'll send it. Uh, I'll send it over, and that way you guys have access to it. And then my last quick reminder for those of you on the call still who are union members, so CSEA, SEIU union members. We do have a meeting this Thursday evening to members only uh, to do some housekeeping and some union business. So that's what I got. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, so everyone, uh, thank you all so much for being here. We will um, stay tuned for Wednesday and uh, hope you have a nice afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>